Well, good evening, everybody. I think we're ready to commence. A very warm welcome to the Royal College of Art. My name is Ken Neal. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities. Uh, and we're very pleased to be collaborating with the Serpentine for tonight's talk in conversation. Kamala Ibrahim Ishag in conversation with Hans Ulrich Obrist. And we are collaborating also, as you can see from the screen, with the Sharjah Art Foundation, the Africa Institute, and Freeze Masters. And this is a celebration, of course, of the States of Oneness exhibition, Kamala's first London solo exhibition, just opened, as we know, at Serpentine. And it's appropriate to give a very warm welcome back to Kamala because she studied with us at the Royal College of Art some time ago in the 60s in uh, studying mural painting and other topics, lithography, topography, and illustration in the late 60s. I've got one or two thanks to give before I pass to Melissa from Serpentine. And obviously, I'd like to thank, again, Kamala and Hans Ulrich, but also colleagues Daisy in Development and Alumni Relations at the RCA for putting the event together. And as always, colleagues in Estates and Campus Operations and the caterers. Can I also thank, please, Charlotte Grace in our School of Architecture and Louisa, who have worked very hard to piece tonight's event together. And of course, thanks to all of our friends at Serpentine. It's now my pleasure to welcome to talk to you, Melissa Blanchflower, Curator, Exhibitions and Public Art at the Serpentine and Curator of the Exhibition. Melissa. Um, thank you and good evening everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here, even in the rain. So on behalf of Bettina Korek, our CEO at the Serpentine and our trustees, we are so honoured to have opened um, States of Oneness, Kamala's new exhibition to the public today. We are especially honoured that Kamala is in London um, this week for us to celebrate the opening, to be here for the installation. So thank you, Kamala, for all your incredible work, not just for this week, not just for the exhibition planning, but all of the work you've given us over the past 60 plus years of your practice. Um, we are always in inspired and enthralled by your practice. And thank you for joining us in London to celebrate your exhibition. I'm also so pleased to welcome so many of Kamala's friends and family who've traveled near and far to, to join us for the celebrations and to be with us this week to pop into the show. So hello again, everyone. Kamala, as we know, has forged such a unique and expansive practice, which is not defined by any singular movement or style. Her work embraces and expresses different earthly and spiritual landscapes, along with histories of Sudanese visual culture across many eras. She takes as her subjects um, women, spiritualism, sar ceremonies, plants, alongside stories told to her from her mother and grandmothers. These are all subjects and themes you'll see throughout the exhibition and we'll be hearing from Kamala and Hans Ulrich this evening. Serpentine's mission is to build new connections between artists and society. And we could not be more proud of this opportunity to share Kamala's work further with audiences in London. In true Serpentine spirit, this exhibition embodies what is possible through ambitious collaborations with international organizations, namely the Sharjah Arts Art Foundation and the Africa Institute. Our co-curator Salah said the other day that it takes a village to raise a child, but we also know that it takes a village of curators, of teams across continents to also create an exhibition. Um, so I want to thank our institutional partners and the co-curators, um, Hul al Kasimi, president of the Sharjah Art Foundation, along with Salah Hassan, director of the Africa Institute, along with the very special Sarah Hamad, assistant curator at Serpentine. I'm extending my thanks also to um, other colleagues and friends who have helped this exhibition make, become a reality. 
um, Judith Greer from the Shah Jarrah Foundation, Fatih Osman, Noor Kamal, the Shah Jarrah Foundation teams, alongside the rest of the Serpentine, um, and Yusomi Omolo, Director of Programs. I would also like to thank Serpentine supporters, without whom um, we would never be able to present such ambitious surveys of artists and uh, such an ambitious survey as, as Kamala's work. Our supporting partner, City Group, um, our supporter circle, Erin Bell and Michael Cohen, ACOM, Gallo Glass, Vile, Arts Council England and Bloomberg Philanthropies. For tonight's talk, of course, we are so delighted to be bringing Kamala back to the Royal College of Art. <laughs> And so we're grateful to the team here, especially um, the dean of, dean of the School of Architecture, Adrian LaHood, who helped make this happen, to the Dean of the School of, of Arts and Humanities, Professor Ken Neal, and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Paul Thompson, for, such a warm, for, the, for their warm hospi hospitality and collaboration. We're also thankful to the Freeze Masters Talks program team, um, to Nicholas Cullinan, to Nathaniel Clements Gillespie, and Anya Sulikomoyowska. Thank you also to the Serpentine Live Programs team um, for making this, um, this event possible during such a busy time in London for arts events. Um, to Kostas Sassinopoulos, Associate Curator of Live Programs, along with Bea Redwick and Eva Spate for putting su together such a great evening. It is my absolute pleasure to um, to pass over the microphone to Kamala Ibrahim Ishak and our Artistic Director of Serpentine, Hansa Rokobrist. Thank you so, so much um, for these introductions. Uh, above all, thank you all so much for being here tonight and uh, coming here, even with all this rain, which is ongoing. And before we start, I thought, we should all give another very, very, very warm welcome to Kamala Ibrahim Ishak. As Melissa said, we are deeply grateful to our partners, to, uh, of course, for tonight, to the RCA, to the Sharjah Art Foundation, the Africa Institute, and um, this uh, exhibition took a long time in the making because not only does it take many people, it also takes time. And uh, about 15 years ago, that was really the beginning, we went to see Tayeb Salih, the Sudanese writer who lived in exile in London, in Wimbledon actually, in his house. And Tayeb Salih, I think we have that in the first image, um, told us about Kamala's work because we always ask writers about their collaborations with poets and, and, and of course with visual artists and he told us about the wedding of design and the amazing cover Kamala uh, you designed for, for him and um, uh, so that was the first time we, we came across your work and then uh, Many years later, uh, we wanted to find more information. Uh, Jus Boslan, to whom we are very grateful, uh, told us about the exhibition in, in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and that led then to a phone call to Fariba, who is here tonight, Fariba Derakshani, who runs the Prince Klaus Fund. Uh, and of course, the Prince Klaus Fund uh, gave the big award to Kamala and also staged an exhibition in, uh, in Amsterdam. Soon after that, uh, we actually uh, realized that in relation to Kamala's work, and not only in relation to Kamala's work, all roads lead to Shaza. And um, uh, of course, we are so delighted that Salah is here tonight. We should give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Salah Hassan has for so many years uh, done such incredible projects with Kamala, introduced the work in London uh, through a group show also at the Whitechapel many years ago. Uh, and we are so grateful, Sarah, to, uh, to you and of course to Hua Al-Kazimi uh, for this wonderful collaboration. It was actually um, Yezomi Umulu, our Director of Curatorial Affairs and Public Programs, and Melissa, uh, curator of the exhibition with Sarah, who went to Sharjah and met there Kamala for the first time. And that uh, led then to the exhibition, which opened yesterday. And for those of you who haven't um, seen it yet, we hope you can all visit. We're going to discuss tonight um, many of the works in the exhibition. But Kamala, I wanted to begin with the beginning and wanted to ask you how it all began. How did you come to art? Or how did art come to you? I don't know how it came to me. 
but I found myself in the in art um, since I was a child because I used to draw or you know scribble actually. Um, then and when I went to school, uh, we had uh, art lessons from the beginning. I mean, we had in the secondary school. After the secondary school, I decided I will go to the uh, art college in Khartoum, which I did. Uh, I worked there. I uh, when I. Uh, graduated from the school uh, after I was uh, teaching, not assistant teacher, <laughs> at the same college uh, for one year. And then I came to England uh, to this college to, the, uh, to study, I mean, to do, I don't know, what, sort of degree, I don't know what. Uh, I worked here for two years first, from 64 to 66. I graduated and went back to home and um, worked for one year. And then I came back. I went to the graphic school. I did lithography, typography, and book illustration. Um, and then I went back home also to teach for so many years at the art college until I uh, left to Oman. I didn't work there. But I was always painting in my house. I have a school to do, and I did so many exhibitions in Sudan and in other places. And actually, in the conversation, which is online on the occasion of uh, the, the Prince Klaus uh, Fund Award in, in, in Amsterdam, you tell the story of your name. Um, and uh, that he was chosen by your parents who were admirers of Nero. Can you tell us about, about that? Because it's a great story. Um, my father was fond of um, uh, Nero, and he, he had a daughter called Kamala. No, actually, his wife was called Kamala, and he wrote a book uh, to Kamala and no more. So he read the book, and then I, when I was born, he called me Kamala. It, was a, it wasn't a common name in Sudan. And actually, some of the old family people they said, uh, no, we, we don't want this name. It is not a Sudanese name. <laughs> and they called me a name, but I wouldn't say it. Because some people, <laughs> some people Sudanese here, I won't say it. Uh, anyway. Uh, my father told me, if they call you with this name, don't answer. <laughs> so um, since I was young. And then the name went on. Thank you. The and I wanted to come back also to the Royal College, because as Salah said yesterday, it's a very much a homecoming also, this exhibition. And as you told us, you studied here mm -hmm. mural studies in 64, and then mm -hmm. you came back to London for lithography and typography. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences as a student here and how you feel to be back today? You told us it's a different building. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, what you learned here. I remember when I first came, I wasn't at ease because I was not um, familiar with uh, other people. I mean, when I came to the college, I remember I, we had two studios, one for nude uh, women and one for, one for nude men. Even for women, it, it wasn't easy to, to, to go in the studio, but I went to the other studio. I thought it would be like, you know, people with clothes. I mean, clothes people. <laughs> In Sudan, you are not, we don't have nude at all. Up to now, I mean. Um, then when I opened the door, it was the nude man. So I closed the door and ran to the other studio. <laughs> I never went in that one. Uh, but even for the nude ladies, it, I was embarrassed in the beginning, yeah, I need to, to just paint him. 
but I got used, you know, when, you know, when I finished the two years study, uh, I got used to, yeah, I drew them with other girls or I, there were so many things I have to get used to. I mean, it was not easy for me. And to adjust to the life in Britain, I mean, I, I used to go to, I, I lived in the Victorian Albert, near the Victorian Albert Museum. This was the studio, but I lived in a hostel here. I don't remember the name yet. Uh, it was next to the, this building, actually, the hostel. Uh, for some time, or for the two years, actually. Um, after that, uh, when I graduated, I went back home. Uh, I started like assistant uh, teach, teacher uh, at the art college in Khartoum. And after one year, I came back. I did the um, lithography, typography at the graphics section for one year course and also went back. Uh, being teaching at the art college, uh, you know, for 20 years, I think, <laughs> when I left uh, the country to Oman. And you told us, uh, because we did actually, during the lockdown, we our first encounter was a Zoom interview. Um, and you told us in this, in this Zoom interview about experiences in London of taking the subway and uh, seeing the reflections of uh, faces yes. in the windows and the distortion being yes. an important moment, uh, it's something which is very present in the exhibition. Can you yes. tell us about that? Yes, because I used to come from the, where I was living by the train. That was also another experience I had to, to see, <laughs> to go through. Um, I used to look, you know, at. You, you have the train, I'll be sitting, say, on this side. Looking at the other side, I, I saw the distortion of the figures. You, you see the figures elongated and very distorted. That was very fascinating to me. And it gave me the idea of um, distortion of the figures. And, I, and then I saw the... Uh, some works of uh, William Blake, I think. Mm -hmm. I used to go to the Tate a lot, yeah, so often and to go to the room where, I think William Blake had a room. Yeah. Is it still there? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about William Blake because that was the other thing you told us in this first interview the importance of, of William Blake. Can you tell us about these first encounters with William Blake's work? I used to go a lot to the Tate. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, although it is very far from where I stayed or the, uh, the college here, uh, I used to go just to see uh, the, the room where, he had a room I, actually at that time. I don't know if it is still there. Uh, I used to go and see his work and I got so fond of it. That is why I started also to do the, some of the distorted figures. And I got fond of it. Other influences, uh, of course, are prehistoric influences of Sudan. And when you went back, you did this amazing mural uh, commission. I think we have an image of that here. Out of facsimiles of the murals actually painted in uh, mm. 1971. Um, I wanted to ask you to tell us about this work. When I worked at the college in 1970, they opened um, uh, the National Museum, Sudan National Museum, and I was asked to do some work for the museum, I mean, for the entrance of the museum. Uh, I went to the library, I started you know, seeing, uh, I started with the prehistoric, uh, all the ages, I mean, up to the, to the Christian period in Sudan. 
And uh, I did the mural starting with the prehistoric. Uh, there were so much figures, you know, th this was part of it. Until I did uh, Madonna. This is the black Madonna. Of course, this is the only black Madonna in the world. I mean, you can find it in, in churches in, in Halfa. I did the black Madonna and then the rest of the Christian period I did, you know, the, up there, the descent of the Christ from the cross and uh, Yeah, I started with the, the prehistoric and then until the, yeah, all the, all the, uh, the mural at the entrance, it is on the ceiling, I mean, and they had to do it down and then they put it up and uh, that is all, I think. It's an incredible work. And then, of course, another influence um, well, the, the Tsar rituals and, and, and ceremonies, uh, maybe we can have those uh, images. Um, actually, these practices of actually of exercising spirits and demons that pass through individuals practiced by women only. And uh, it's, it's fascinating because you told us uh, in the conversation that when you attended these Tsar rituals, that you were not allowed to take photographs. You could no. only make sketches, no. mm. um, and only make sketches and, and record the sounds. And that made me think of something Nancy Spiro and Leon Golub, whom we both showed us at the, at the Serpentine, mm. told us some, many years ago, when they said, you know, that maybe painting goes where the camera cannot go. Uh, mm. Can you tell us about your memories of this? Because it's of course also important that many of these rituals have disappeared. The, um, uh, Byung-Chul Han, the, the Korean-German philosopher, wrote a whole book about the importance of, of bringing, of kind of thinking about rituals in our time, and rituals have disappeared. And you told us that many of these Tsar rituals today have disappeared. So it would be wonderful to hear about your memories and, and also tell us about how it entered the work. The Tsar actually is a sort of, uh, not a spiritual, actually. It's, uh, Yes, it's, it's a sort of, um, I wasn't familiar with the Tsar in Sudan when I was there. I mean, we didn't go to Tsar ceremonies and I, but when I was doing the William Blake, uh, when I'm studying it, I, I was supposed to write about William Blake. When, uh, then I, I, I thought about similarity in this spiritual, um, he, he, he said uh, something like uh, some spirits uh, would uh, tell him to how to paint, uh, how to write uh, poems with the paintings. And then I, I went to my professor. He was called Mr. Hevesi, I think. That was ages ago, of course. Uh, and uh, I said there is something very similar to what William Lake is, is thinking of or doing. Uh, there is a cult in Sudan called the Tsar. Uh, people do the same, the same uh, rituals. And he said, why don't you do a comparison between the two? Which I did, and I had like three months to go back home and to do the study, I mean, there. I went back and I asked some old lady to take me to a czar ceremony or something like that. that was the first time I went to. And I went first to the Sheikha. Sheikha is the, guru, uh, the leader of the group called Sheikha. She will have assistants who will help her in, in our, uh, the ceremony, I mean. Um, I asked her if I can take photographs if, if they have uh, a ceremony. She said, no, no photography. But I thought I would do some sketches when I was there and seeing them. Um, she allowed me to, to, to be there in one of the ceremonies. I went and did some sketches. 
and then I started uh, doing the paintings as I, from the sketch. Although in my painting, I never sketch. I just go to the canvas and do my painting. But I had to do some sketches from what I saw in the Tsar. Um, it was one ceremony I went to. I, I mean, I, I didn't go inside because I, I was not allowed, I mean. I was just looking from a window uh, and doing the sketches and think. Um, it is a sort of uh, a healing. Usually women, they have psychological illnesses and they get, um, they, they do this uh, sort of ceremonies, you know, the cult. And they get like possessed with the spirits. I mean, there are so many spirits there. I had to write about them and the songs they, they had. And I tried to translate them as much as I can, yeah, because it's not like a poem. It is like, um, you know, words put together, I mean. I brought it back uh, and I did, uh, ah, I, I recorded uh, the drumming and the songs. Brought it with me like, and then I wrote the songs and the meanings and everything uh, to my professor and he had it and uh, that was my thesis for, to graduate, I mean. And then many years later you did this painting the, uh, I, uh, later, of course, I, I benefit from the, what I saw. I, I mean, some of them, yeah, this is like one of them. I wanted to ask you also about the Crystallist group because, uh, of course, your work can never be reduced to a movement, uh, 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 but it's still important, I think, to talk a little bit about the Crystallist group. Here we have these seminal painting women in crystal cubes. Um, you played an instrumental role in this crystallist group. Um, uh, the manifesto, as you told me, uh, was written by one of your students. It was really uh, the idea also of differentiating it from the Khartoum school, um, which was totally dominated by, by men. It was a, um, a movement where women played the central role, the crystallist movement. Um, and, um, it's characterized by transparencies and crystal-like qualities, as we can see it here in, in the painting. You told me also that uh, the name of the school came from a drawing technique that you invented many years ago uh, with these transparent orbs. Can, can you tell us about that? Actually, it was, uh, I had an exhibition at the National Museum that was a very exhibition there. I had a, a, a long painting, like three meters uh, wide. There were 15 uh, crystal balls. This is what I called it. It wasn't meant to, to be a, a name for a, a group of, uh, of people who are practicing. Um, th th this is how the name was. It was, I mean, taken. One of my students uh, called it the um, crystal, crystal group. Or the, but it wasn't meant like that. I just did the painting. Uh, I think that it, this painting was called 15 Crystal Balls, the name of the painting. One of my students wrote a manifesto about the crystallist and uh, uh, like they did it as a movement or something like that. Um, it wasn't meant actually. And I don't think that uh, they call it a school. It's not a school or anything. Uh, but whatever they thought, I mean, the students started practicing. I, I went on working as like, um, um, transparencies in, in my paintings. Uh, it was not like this painting, uh, of course, like um, this is the, 
uh, crystal cubes people uh, in a crystal cubes um, yeah and i worked so many paintings with uh, like crystal cubes crystal balls i mean i mean people inside them ah this is also one of them <laughs> You mentioned uh, the importance no, of, the, of the students, your students, uh, uh, and we spoke about that quite a lot actually um, over the last couple of days. The, the, and we saw also yesterday at the opening, many of your students came, and of course, we are so delighted uh, that the amazing artist Hassan Musa is here tonight. We should give him a round of applause, <laughs> who came all the way from the south of France to attend uh, your opening. And uh, Hassan told us that it all began mm -hmm. for, for, for him with uh, studying with you. Can you tell us about uh, the way you, you teach art? What's the advice you give to young artists? I mean, Rana Maria Ricci wrote this little book, which is an advice to a young poet. I was wondering what is Kamala's advice to young artists? Because obviously also many young artists attend the talk here tonight. So I wanted to hear your advice to young artists and the way you teach? Actually, when I started teaching, yes, Hassan is one of them. I used to bring my canvas with them in the studio. I stretch it like in the wall there, you know, <laughs> and uh, work. And they do work like, they, I, I allow them to work. It's not like uh, they copy me, they don't but they create their own, I think. Uh, but this is the way I want them to, each of them, to do what he feels or what he would, uh, would create as, as a painting, I mean. Uh, I never thought, the, 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 I don't know that it was traditional way or something like that, but I thought I would just uh, paint with them in the studio. We all paint. We can benefit from each other, actually. I thought about that. And this is how I did it. So painting together? Yeah, we yeah. painted together. I think this is the best way. I don't know, it couldn't be. People, so many teachers disagree, but it's the way I, I thought I would do. And, uh, I don't know if they benefited from this or not, they have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads, of course, also back to the murals, because uh, you yeah. told us also that your students painted uh, murals together. Yeah, some, no? some did, yeah. yeah. Now, another topic uh, I thought would be really important, because that's another really important dimension to the show, is the plants. And um, Alexis Pauling Gams, who inspired us at the Serpentine a lot for our Back to Earth project and also the book we did, Remember Nature, said that we have the opportunity now as a species fully in touch with each other. And um, Alexis refers, of course, to technology to unlearn and relearn <coughs> our own patterns of thinking and storytelling in a way that allows us to be in communion with our environment, in communion with the environment and not yes, yes. in a dominating or colonialist separation from the environment. And I feel that that's uh, what so much of your work is about, this communion with plants and trees. Um, and when we did this first Zoom interview, you were in your studio and uh, you told us about your garden. You, you said you have a small garden with many plants and that every morning you breathe the plants and that they really... I talk to them. Yeah, you talk to yeah. them. I wanted to hear about yeah. that. Because Some people think that I'm mad or something like that. <laughs> but I know they feel me. I do, I, they don't reply, of course. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but when I talk to them, I feel they... they, they I don't know, some sort of reaction. Uh, sometimes when one of, the, of my plants doesn't flower, and then I say, why? <laughs> <laughs> really? Wallahi. 
in, in, uh, uh, not a few days after that, I say, why didn't you flower? See this one beside you, it did flower. <laughs> after three days, I, would, I, I found it flowering. <laughs> I know nobody believed me, but this is what happens in my garden, that is all. Beautiful, and that of course, enters the work, the connection. But uh, uh, why don't they try it and see? <laughs> but uh, it seems that too, I, I know don't, they don't believe me, but if they are really genuine with their plants, I mean, I don't want to say respect, but <laughs> if they respect their plants and I talk to them as human, uh, not human, I mean as Source of creation of God, I mean, human and plants, and we are all the same. Why don't I talk to them? And try, I really advise anybody to try to, to, to talk to their plants. If they don't um, react, they are not genuinely in love with their plants. <laughs> this, I really believe in that. Yeah, it's beautiful, actually. During the lockdown, when I couldn't make studio visits, I started to have conversations with the plants. I tried to do to interview plants. Now, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> obviously the the plants, you know, and this connection between human life and plant life is also explored in many of your works. And I wanted us to maybe look at Bait Al Mal, no? Uh, if we could have Bait Al Mal, which is uh, an extraordinary work, which uh, who Al Kazimi actually. Uh, commissioned for uh, an exhibition, I think in Lahore, for the Lahore yeah, uh, Bayani. And there you can mind, also yeah. see this connection uh, between human and plant life. Can you tell us about this painting? Better, this is where I was born. Yeah. It's an area in, in Omdurman, uh, near the river, actually, Vijay. And in the, in the middle of the, the, the area. This is where we were born. I think Huda was born there also. <laughs> and uh, uh, after, ages after me. <laughs> and uh, I did, the, the, in the middle there was this, uh, the houses. In this area, we, uh, Hosh, we call it Hosh, uh, a large area. Um, all the uh, aunts and uncles, I mean, uh, they, they, they have their own houses inside this build, uh, this area. And it, it, it is all in one, in one house. Um, I was born in this place. When I was young, I was giving to my two uh, great aunts or grandmothers. Sometimes they give, you know, a child to the grandmothers to yeah, and to help in, yeah, they sent them to do something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was with them, that was in the middle. I was between the two grandmothers, and uh, I was very young, before I went to school. I lived with them. Uh, I really benefit from my, my stay with them. It's before, yeah, and, uh, telling me stories or uh, about life and everything. Um, I used to get very early in the morning, like three in the morning, till now. Uh, and then, because they got up very early to pray, the morning prayers. And I get up with them, so I got used to this. They tell me stories, and I, I benefit from the stories they told me in my work, actually, later. <laughs> and uh, there was a, a house here. With, this man is married to a Jin woman. This is one of the stories. I, I, I drew this. There is a tree here. You know, this tree after the... the this, triangular shape. Uh, there, were, there was a tree, and this is the man, and this is the woman on the other side. The story they told me that this man is married to a, a, a Jin woman, and he had children 
who would be on this tree, actually. Um, I, paint, I painted this, this horse, where, with, I mean this house, of the jinn with woman, with the, her husband and her children. And, uh, and the, the, the rest of the area is the people who lived around. I, I don't know, I, of course I didn't see the jinn, but I, when we leave the horse to go to school, we pass by it. Uh, when we pass by it, we run because we were frightened that it, it, it will catch us or something like that. That, that was so many stories. Uh, I, I benefited from them, with my art. I mean, I painted all, everything. Every, uh, every story they told me and every, yeah, from the two grandmothers, I mean. Beautiful. And another work um, I thought we could maybe have a look at now is Blues for the Martyrs. Um, that's again about the connection between human and plant life, but in a very different way, because this work has to do with the tragic massacre, the Khartoum massacre, where actually many young people disappeared, um, were killed and, and drowned in, in the river in this massacre. And yeah. you, you imagine them grow into trees. Can you tell us about the, the genesis of this, this work, which is the most recent work yeah, in the this exhibition? Yeah, when we had an uprising, so many young chaps were murdered and thrown into the river. I live in an area near to the military barracks or you know, know, where they were killed, actually. And uh, there were photographs of so many uh, young boys and girls were killed and thrown in the river. After a few, I think after a few months, I started painting this painting. Uh, I, I put every, I mean, few of them, like six, seven, or five, or in, a, in one of the bowls. And these were thrown in the river. Uh, it was a tragic event, actually. That was the first time I used blue. In, in, uh, because this is the river, actually. Uh, I also li lived near the river, actually. If, uh, I thought they would grow into plants after they thrown them in the river. This is why I, I did these um, uh, plants. You also mentioned yesterday that um, it's actually artists who are leading in this revolution. You said before it was the poets. Sorry? Uh, you also told, told us yesterday that it's artists who are leading in this revolution. Uh, in yeah. this, and before it was poets, but now in Sudan it's artists taking a leading role in this revolution. And you also told us about this very long mural almost kilometer long mural your students were doing. Can you tell us about that? Yes, they did, I don't know how many meters. They, they painted it on the ground uh, from the first, I mean, the whole street. That was the longest painting, but it was destroyed later. And you actually told me also that, because I always ask artists about their unrealized project, you know, and we know a lot about architects' unrealized projects because architects publish them, but we know very little, mm. very regularly publish them, we know very little about visual artists' unrealized projects. And I always remember when I asked Louise Bourgeois about her unrealized project, she said she wanted to be the little amphitheater, uh, like to do architecture, actually, and nobody knew that. And when mm. I ask you about your unrealized project, you told me that you want you have this unrealized project of doing a very big painting. Yes. Can you tell us about that? I just said um, I have 
I did uh, long paintings, uh, like two meters, three meters, four meters, mm -hmm. sometimes. But I have a role. I didn't uh, stretch it. I said I am going to stretch this. Uh, I have a big studio to stretch this uh, um, canvas, uh, roll of canvas, which is 10 meters. And I'm going to work on it. I'm to, the whole stro story is this painting. I don't know how it would be stretched, but we didn't have a, 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 a wood uh, that would do it. But uh, they can see what to do about it. But I would uh, do it on my studio, and then uh, whoever can stretch it, okay. But I'm thinking about it. I always think about it because I want to do a whole story. And what would the story be about? At that time, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> now also, you know, I, when I paint, I I, I just uh, say, I sit in front of my canvas. I don't sketch or I don't do anything. You know what I mean before and then just fill it as a painting. I just sit in front of my canvas and I start working. I get the, uh, or the painting will, will come. So you never make preparatory sketches and the drawings no. in the exhibition are no, independent no. works. I never works. did, yeah. I never did. And when is a painting finished? When it is finished. <laughs> uh, for this, when I found that uh, the, all these uh, martyrs grew into plants, then it finished. You also, <laughs> uh, and before we talk about these works, I uh, had one more, one more question about uh, small and big paintings, because in the exhibition, there are also micrograms there. I mean, Robert Walser, the Swiss writer, mm. made these micrograms because his handwriting became smaller and smaller. Um, and a lot of people for a long time thought it was a secret writing. Um, but then it was mm. actually deciphered. A scholar, Werner Morlang, deciphered these micrograms. And uh, you have microgram paintings, tiny, tiny mm. paintings. Mm. And you told us yesterday that they were actually born from the idea the people would always say, Kamala, you only paint big. So you yeah. said that you can also paint small. Can you tell us about these micrograms? It's almost like an exhibition within the exhibition. There is a vitrine mm. where there is a big number of small paintings, but they are also quite monumental in a way. Can you tell us about those? But people thought I cannot do a, a small painting because I always do murals. That is why I did the smallest paintings, like uh, one inch, square inch. <laughs> that is what you find them in that um, table. I had, I have a lot of them at home. But these were the, what were photographed. But I do small paintings. And I said, I'm going to do an exhibition of the smallest paintings. To see that I can do the smallest and the largest. <laughs> I'm, I mean, am I able if I am do the, I would do a, a large painting? How would I not be able to do the small painting? <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you also go with your painting uh, beyond the canvas. Um, the calabashes are one, one example mm. um, where you paint on, on these different surfaces. Can you tell us about those? My, I thought I can paint on any surface. That was the first one I tried. I mean, I go to calabash, they are strong and they're fixed. I did a lot of them, I mean. I painted stories or figures or in them, on the calabash. This is the oil paint. And you can paint in any, sub, in any surface. 
I mean, I'm not bound by canvas or paper or whatever. I, I, I just like, like to try any, any, any surface. That's why I started to do with the Calabash. As our friend Zaha Hadid, the late Zaha Hadid always says, there is no end to experimentation. And that's no. so yeah. true for your work, I, yeah. I feel. Uh, and not only do you do these calabashes, but you also actually um, paint on, on, on textiles and you make these dresses, uh, which are extraordinary. And we want to also express our gratitude to the amazing Nahid Makbal. A big round of applause, who is here tonight. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, Nahid uh, is wearing uh, this, amazing, this amazing dress, which is a work of yours, uh, Kamala. So big round of applause. <laughs> so can you tell us about, about the dresses? I paint on, on clothes. I like to paint clothes. I don't know how many I did in my life, in hundreds uh, of tops. <laughs> Actually, I would have had three of them. So, uh, I want to try every medium. Material, calabash, uh, this is drums. Here you paint on leather. Ah, leather on leather, drums. And I wanted also not only to try every medium, I, every, also I do, this is circular uh, or, yeah, circular painting. Or, um, I mean, different, uh, different, this is uh, partition. Um, I mean, I like to try everything. And what's the role of drawing? Because we, we know from what you said before that the drawings are never preparatory sketches, um, but we show a lot of drawings in the exhibition. What's the role of drawing for you in, in the practice? I do drawings because the drawing is, is a, a piece of art by itself. It doesn't have to be like a sketch for a painting. I never sketch, actually. If I do a drawing, this is a, 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 a piece of art. It doesn't have to be in paint to be a, a work of art. And then, of course, there is also your activity which goes beyond painting and drawing. Uh, the involvement you have with also social projects, and I'm particularly interested in this Sukia Sudan organization, which provides water to remote areas and villages uh, throughout Sudan, because you are an advocate of Sukia Sudan organization. Uh, and I wanted to ask you to tell us about that, because it's a less known aspect of your practice, but I think it would be really great for everyone to hear about that, because you... Is anybody can do if they really want to help the people in the remote areas with no water. Uh, there is an, an organization called Sugia, Sugia Sudan. Uh, I am part of it. I mean, actually, it was not me. I, I, I did the group, but uh, when I knew about it, I, I joined the group. Uh, we arranged to dig wells uh, for remote areas where people don't have water. And um, sometimes we, I don't know what you call it here. People who are better in English can't help me. We uh, Solar panels. Uh, solar panels? We have solar. Yeah. Solar, because there are no electricity some, in some places. We did solar in some parts, but um, uh, uh, I 
بتعمل اي كرتاك لكن انا ما بعرف اذا من انجلش But I don't know it. I don't think you would know it because uh, <laughs> you go, you have your own water. Is it much new Karjaka? Pump. Ah, okay. This is a description actually for. You. Yeah, I exactly. Mm. Now, talking about water, I also wanted to ask you to tell us the story how you actually became involved because you went as a student very early on in, in your life on an academic trip to the Blue Nile and you traveled by lorry and then you ran out of water. There was no more water and you had to drink. Yes, I wanted yes, to hear this yes, story. Yes, that was very strange. When I was started teaching, I mean. We used to go to uh, trips to remote areas of the country. One time uh, we went, you know, the Sudanese would know it. We went westward to near the border with Ethiopia. We, had, we were on a lorry. And we had law, uh, there were so many students, and I was, at that time, I was uh, not a full staff, but like um, assistant, I mean. When we ran out of water, we passed by, I don't know what you call it in English. The kabir al daira kida bitaat. لما حفير ده البركة لكن عنده اسم تاني ها أشنو لا مش رهد عنده اسم تاني لايك كده لكن it has a name in Arabic I don't remember it المهم جينا بيها والمفروض نشرب لقينا إن هي في إنسكت كتيرة كفر إيش مش نو؟ But you know, Edouard Lisson always said every talk needs at least two languages. We need to celebrate multilingualism. So all is well. إيش مش نو؟ And I said, <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, no, this is great. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, we ran out of water. Yeah. In an area, people get water for, for I found some women were taking like a um, uh, can on their heads to go for miles to get water. From this, uh, is, is it called reservoir? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, this one. And we came by it. It was actually full of insects. So they, the, all the boys and girls in the lorry, they said they won't drink, drink from this. Okay? You, either you drink or die. <laughs> because there is no water. I, and I started to show them. I take the, I can't say, I just uh, <laughs> try to uh, take the insects away and just uh, take the water and drink. They say, we won't drink. Okay, I will drink it. If you don't drink, you will die. Because we are going to go miles and miles until we are in the Kormok, which is next door to Ethiopia. It's a long way to go. 
And uh, by the time we reach uh, Kormok, which where there is, would be some water, it, they have to either drink from this water with insects or die. So I took some water, I just, just, uh, just uh, uh, took the uh, water quickly and drank some of it. You see, uh, decide <laughs> what would you do? So of course, most of them <laughs> drank from it. They just took it, they, they uh, uh, just um, try to just uh, grab their nose and just drink it quickly. Until we arrive at the Kormok, where there is uh, water in there, I mean. It was a very good experience for them all. And it's fascinating you because have it's... To, you have to face fr uh, hardships of any sort. I thought maybe at the very end of this conversation, we could um, go back to the beginning because we began in the 60s and with you coming here to the Royal College. And actually, the year when you were here for the second time in 1969, there's this very um, uh, fascinating painting called Lex Dance. Maybe we don't have an image of that. Do we have the image of two women, Eve and Eve? Because maybe we could end on that. Because I think we need to end on an artwork again after having talked about the work with water. And because, of course, water brings us also back to plants, no? The, mm. the watering of the plants. And there's another amazing work, which is about the communion with humans and plants, which is this painting, Two Women, Eve and Eve. And um, of course, uh, I have two la very old neem trees. Uh, where I live, uh, that was my grandmother's house, actually. I inherited this in the end, I mean. And they have two very old neem trees, one in front of the house, one at the back of the house. When we moved to this house and we had uh, to build our house, my husband uh, told uh, his friend, uh, engineer, you build the house between the two trees. You don't cut them. I mean, to make way for uh, the building. He said the building would be between the two trees. And it is if, as if it was guarding us. Actually, it is. Uh, we have the two neem trees still now. They were planted, they told us they were planted in 1908. And still they are surviving, v very huge trees. I like them very much, you know, uh, as if they are guarding us. And the house is in, in between them. But these women, uh, I just put them between the two trees uh, this is a story. Uh, in Sudan, when somebody dies in the family, the, wom the women would come to sympathize, I mean, with them, and they will bend over the, the head of the woman whose husband died and cry with her. This is a tradition in Sudan. Uh, these boys would know about it. And uh, so I painted the two women. Uh, I called it even if, or sometimes I say two women, but it is even if. It's fascinating because, of course, in London, many of us saw the Tarin Simon piece, no, which had to do with different morning rituals. Uh, very, very last question, Kamala. I wanted to ask you about your your definition of of art. Um, you, you told us this beautiful quote that art is life, it's no less than that. Can you yes. explain that to us? To me, actually. Because uh, and since I was young, very 
I mean, a girl, little girl. I used to draw and I, so to me, it is my life. I always paint, uh, since I started painting or after I went to the college and started painting, <coughs> I never stopped one day. Even I would do the small ones. I mean, if, if I don't have a canvas or I don't have a large uh, piece, uh, I would do the small pieces on paper or on board or on whatever, uh, wood or something like that. Uh, some of the small paint, I call them paintings. I mean, uh, they are one square inch. And they say, this is not a painting. It is. <laughs> I did paint it because I know it is on, on canvas or on board. On on um, on board or on a wood board or something like that, but I painted it small or large. It is a painting. If you paint it, it is a painting. That is, I say. Uh, that is why I say I have the small paintings and the largest paintings. And I love the idea that you never stopped a day. No. <laughs> I mean, that Unless I am around uh, in England or in somewhere else. <laughs> it's very beautiful, Kamala. Art is life. It's no less um, than that. And uh, for all of you who want to listen again to the talk, we're very grateful to Freeze because this is going to become a podcast. Uh, and we're, of course, so deeply grateful, Kamala, to you. A big round of applause for Kamala Ibrahim Isla. <laughs> My name's Charlotte Grace, I curate the public program in the School of Architecture, and I've got some friends to have a chat with, which I'm really pleased. <laughs> some nice, beautiful flowers for you, yeah, and we're so uh, honoured to have you at the school. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a real honour that she chose to come back to the RCA. It was like, what a lovely, beautiful request to help Actually, me when I came in, I wanted to cry. Oh. <laughs> oh, so nice. It was ages I didn't come to. I, I wish I'd... I, used to come every few years to visit the, the place I loved most. Yeah, well, I, I really loved it. Yeah. Well, it was so part the, the, the best and the richest part of my life when I came to the Royal College here. And I think I... I it, <laughs> Thank you all so much yeah. for being here. And another big round of applause for Kamala. No, this is not for me, this is for them. This is for the colleague, not for me. <laughs> <laughs>